I'm at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and we're honored to have with us today Miss Patricia Meyer, who has graciously agreed to be interviewed for the uh, Veterans History Project today. Miss Meyer, we want to thank you on behalf of the History Center and the Library of Congress for agreeing to come in and talk to us today. Well. We've also got uh, three members of Miss Meyer's family here, and would you please just introduce yourselves and give us your addresses, please? I'm Kathy McDaniel. I'm from Johns Island, South Carolina, her daughter. And I'm Robin Hulse, and um, her daughter, and I live in Peachtree City, Georgia. Ken Hulse, a uh, famous um, son-in-law of Patricia, and I live with Robin in Peachtree City. And we also have Tony Hilliard, who is in charge of uh, the project here at the History Center. Yeah, my name is Tony Hilliard, and I live in Tucker, Georgia. Thank you. Ms. Meyer, again, I, we want to thank you for coming in here and agreeing to tell us about not only your, your uh, military experience, but also a little bit about your life. And uh, would you give us your full name, your address, and your date of birth, please? My full name is Patricia Ann Meyer. I live at 111 Quail Run in Peachtree City, Georgia. And what is your date of birth? July 7, 1925. Okay. Would you tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your, your early life, where you lived, a little bit about your family growing up? I was born in Lima, Ohio, and resided there until I was about four. Uh, let's see, that would have been 1929, my father lost his business. So we moved from Ohio to Iowa, where my mother's parents lived. Uh, we resided with them for a short while. And that's where I began my, well, I would see, I guess it was the first grade that I went into in Iowa. I had attained, uh, I had gone to one year, maybe it was a second, one year in Ohio at a school, a school called Horace Mann. And when we moved to Iowa, then I continued my education. And that's the state I was educated in entirely, Iowa. Did you have brothers and sisters? I have two sisters and one brother. Um, my, what would you like to know about them? That's uh, anything you want to tell me, but maybe I just want to find out if you have <laughs> Well, <laughs> apropos to this interview, my oldest sister was a wave during World War II. My brother was with the Air Force and flew the hump in India. He flew supplies. Uh -huh. um, so that was my... And my Younger sister was much too young okay. to participate. Well, tell us about your you and your your uh, siblings entering the service. So uh, you, I assume, volunteered to go into the army. Is that correct? I did. Um, I was engaged to a young fellow from Iowa, and he was serving in the Pacific and we didn't hear from him too often. Um, I just felt it was part of my duty to help him out. I didn't, that was my main focus at that point. Um, so I enlisted, my brother of course was, what do you call it, what's the word? Drafted. Drafted. Uh, my oldest sister joined on her own because she felt Patrick out there, I guess. What year did you join? Do you remember? Was it... Uh, 44, 44. 1944. Okay. How did your parents feel about that? At that point, my father had just died in 1943. So that was my mother was... Uh, I am sure she didn't feel too good about my leaving after the other to have gone, but um, she went along with it. 
I was still underage. He had to sign for me to go, go in. Before we get into your actual military service and your training, I, I want to ask you one question. Uh, where were you when uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed? How did you find out? And what was the, not only your reaction, but the general reaction around you, around the, your town, around the family? I do not remember where I was specifically, but I remember the feeling I have of, of what a horrendous thing has happened to this, to our people in Hawaii. Uh, and I remember my father being very upset. But that's all I re really remember about okay. that. Talk about uh, your early days in the Army, uh, your training, your your trip from home to wherever you started your training, and where you were, and any experiences that stand out in connection with your training? Well, my basic training was in Des Moines, Iowa. So it was very close to home. Uh, the Army, of course, paid my best bus fare, and I just went in with my eyes wide open, and it was an adventure. And it was it was fun, truly. Um, I was a rather regimented, regimented person, so all the rules and regulations didn't mean much to me. I could follow them easily and had no problem with it. Had good cadre. Um, certainly didn't win any medals for doing the best of anything, but made some very good friends in that first group, and some of us were um, shipped out to bowling field together so I could continue that, those friendships. Where were most of the women from that were in your first All training? All over. California, Indiana, um, I'm trying to think of Texas. Um, I don't know, but... Was this the first time you'd been exposed to people from all over the country? Yes. What was that like? Uh, wonderful. A feeling of kind of relief. I had led a very sheltered life in the middle of the country, in the middle of a cornfield in Iowa, and discovered that people were very much the same and very likable. What were you being trained to do in your initial training? What, what types of things did, did you do and the what clerk. were they training you to do? Clerk. Uh, what they called a clerk. Okay. It was just a stenographer, okay. which I was good at doing. Okay. So. Okay. Talk about what happened after you left your initial training, where you went, your experiences. Just. Um, I was shipped to Bowling Field where I was assigned to the main entry desk where guys came in from overseas when they had finished their term that they had to be there. So I got to meet all the good guys and okay. it was kind of fun. Um, and that was my main, that was my job just interviewing the guys when they came in. So you'd actually sit down with them and talk to them about their Oh, experience. no, I think, no, no, the whole group in, in the back office did that, but what I, I mostly took basic information. Okay. Where they, and I don't even remember what a form looked like then, mm -hmm. but where they came from, how long we were there, people that you wanted, they wanted to be notified, and you know, just... Well, that had to be pretty interesting. It I was. It was. So what happened to the guy in the Pacific? Good question. What? You were, you were engaged to someone in the Pacific. What happened to him? Oh, oh. Yeah, how did we get <laughs> from there? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, how did we get from there to dad? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, let's, let's fill in that blank. Somewhere <laughs> in that period, I went to visit him at his parents' home. His parents were farmers in Iowa. He was a good guy. 
and he and I had a long talk, and I gave him back his room, ring because I said, this isn't going to work. I've met somebody else. And that somebody else was? Was their father. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> While I was at Bowling Field and worked in this little office, upstairs they had a big photography shop. And one of the people involved in that was uh, Robert Meyer. And I met him at the USO, which was right there on the field. And we were together, I guess, kind of from there on. And that's what precipitated giving back the ring <laughs> to the fiance. <laughs> but um, Now we have a picture that he took of you at some point. Could you show that to the to the camera? And yes. Just, looks nothing like me now. <laughs> oh, I see your resemblance. Okay. Okay. Yes. He enjoyed doing that simply yeah. because he could set us all up. He did it for friends of mine. Yeah. Did he stay in the photography business when he got out of the No he did not. Okay. No he did not. Now, you were in Washington. Yes. And I'm assuming this was the, the the first time you'd ever been to Washington. Yes, it was. Talk about your experience there. What what was the city like during the war? The the atmosphere and the experiences you had that were so very gung ho out. for service people. Couldn't do enough for anybody that was in the service. Um, actually, a very quiet city. But I had time. I had a lot of time, of course, and I did love to go and see the government buildings, and uh, that was a thing that Bob and I used to do: is go around what's the circle with the cherry blossoms? Um, the ellipse. Where in D.C. Right. But we used to go and take pictures there, and yeah. had a good time there. But. Now, we went into Europe, well, we went into Normandy at least in uh, 1944. Yes. In June. Were you in Washington by then? When we. I went in in August. Of 44? Of 44. Okay, that I was wasn't in very long. That was a little bit after. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Would you describe this picture? Tell us the background of that picture. Well, this. This picture is a group of all the ladies in my squadron assigned a bowling field who had red hair. <laughs> there was a gentleman from the Anacostia Naval Base next door who said he was unfortunate enough to get a disease from one of the red-headed wax <laughs> at Bowling Field. So we all got together at the picture in, in on the, I don't, I don't know where that was, but then he was supposed to pick one of us out. Never found out who it was. Wasn't he? <laughs> I didn't know any Navy guys. Sorry, Ken. <laughs> Talk about some of the uh, individuals that you got to know in your group, in your unit. Just what their backgrounds were that were different from you and you know what you learned from them. Well, this turned out to be one of the best friends I could ever have. She was from Ohio. Her name was Judy Burnett. Uh, Eventually, when we got out of the service together, which was after about 14 months, she and I lived together in a rooming house in Washington, D.C. She had a job at, I don't know what she did, I worked at a hospital. Um, some of the others I did not keep in contact with, but I have fond memories of them all. They're, they're a unique bunch. Uh, Judy and I, this very good friend, and I used to go down to base operations on Saturday or Sunday, 
see what pilot had to put his hours in to get his flight pay, climb on the plane, and just have, go for a ride. If they wanted to watch some game that was going on, I just remember Philadelphia for some reason, or New York. They'd fly over there and then fly around and around and um, watch the game and we just, I don't know what we did. It was fun, I guess. <laughs> it must have been. You were it. Yeah. Well, I loved to fly. I loved. I, I could have stayed down at base up all the time. What were your living conditions like? Were you in barracks or? We were in barracks, uh, single, uh, single floor. With of course, the sergeant up here in her room with her private bath. Uh, we all had duty where we had to clean the latrine and I don't remember that at Bowling Field we did not have KP. The ladies did not. We got out of a good bit of some of that stuff because we were at Bowling Field. But Describe the social life. I mean I know you were dating somebody but you had a group of good looking young ladies yeah, we there. Did. And, uh, well we it, <coughs> Excuse me. We did spend a lot of time at the USO because they did provide entertainment, food, uh, games. I don't know. I kind of remember there was a bowling alley there, but we just had a good time. And the guys, of course, would come in um, for. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> We all did go to the mess hall for meals. We did not have to participate. We just got our meals, and the food was not bad. Thank you. Bowling Field was a place where some of the generals and the top people came in. So I guess they didn't want us to. They didn't want them to see us doing some of the drudge work. Yeah. I remember going out the main gate one time and Harry Truman was coming in. He got out of the car and said, hi, and how are you? And he was a good old boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, remember seeing Hap Arnold oh. on the street one time. Your father gave me a big hug and Hap Arnold happened to go by. And he got out of the car and he said, that is not proper military behavior. <laughs> and of course, we slunk away. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there were, there were people coming in there all the time that were renowned. Um, I'm trying to think of, oh, they had, oh, we had tennis. I remember we played a lot of tennis, really. Good courts. What else did we do? <coughs> Mostly we went into D.C. to movies. Probably had a movie on the base, but I don't remember that. Um, to dinners. I always see films of a lot of dancing <laughs> that went on during World War II. Did, did, did you go we to had dance? an old... Glenn Miller's band, what was left of that band, came into Bowling Field. And oh, what a sound. And of course, that was after he was lost. But what was left of that? Um, and they played at our USO. Oh, my word, that was. That, that gives me the goosebumps now to think about it. It was so good. And we felt so bad for him. Was there a big crowd there? Everybody that could go away? Oh, I'm, a, I'm sure there was. Yeah, I'm sure there was. You brought uh, part of your uniform and a pen that we'd like you to describe and show to the camera, please. Uh, this is the symbol, it's a symbol of Athena, who is the symbol of the WAC, Women's Army. 
I think that's it. Yeah, so no. it is. Yeah. Now, there was something else here that I had that on it. No, I guess not. Um, that's the only one I saw that had okay. on it. I, I think sure. that's it. I, it looks like it. Yeah. And would you describe the your blouse? And the blouse is really military issue. Oh, yeah. But my daughter and I were looking at this the other day and commenting on how well it was made. It was, you could go to the tailor on the base and get your uniform tailored. And a lot of the people did if they, but actually this shirt was just everyday wear, beautifully made, and almost looked as if it were tailored. What is that, cotton? Yes, I'm sure it was. There is another pin in here that I didn't notice at first of a thing. Did you wear that on your uniform also, or is that on your cap? Yeah, or? Probably was on the cap, yeah. Yeah, that one I like, that little one. Yeah. Um, kind of when we got away from boot camp, um, the what a, core is the spirit of the core was not as much with us as it was when you were in basic training or at some of the other bases where they had to be a little bit more on guard. You know. yeah. Uh, it was a little bit more pleasant, I think. Yeah. In retrospect, I know that now. Right. I didn't know it then. Could you tell us just a little bit about what basic training was like for a, a woman? Uh, basically the same as it was for the man. We had calisthenics, we had marches, and the old saying, your mother wears army boots, was true. <laughs> we had... To, we had clunky old boots, and we had to wear GI underwear. We had to wear, of course, your, you know, uniforms. Had to make sure that cap was on straight. Had to make sure you knew how to salute, when, and where. Um, so it was pretty much what the men had to go through, except I'm sure it wasn't quite as diligent. Um, but we had six weeks of that, huh. and... Did you fire a gun? Oh, no. 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 Didn't have any of that stuff. Um, no, I think... I had a chance to go to China, but the guys all took me out of it. Talked me out of it. Well, talk but, about that. What, what would you have been doing in China? I don't know. I just wanted to go to China. <laughs> uh, it was something that they said they needed a, you know, a bunch of people in China, and I thought, gee, that'd be fun. Now, what convinced you not to go? Were those guys? What did they tell you? My my guy friends in the service said, uh, uh, you don't want to go there. No, no way, Jose. You don't do it. So I guess I listened to them. <laughs> said it was a little bit too rough. Yeah. So. How many of the women in your unit? at bowling had been with you in basic training? And did some of them move with you? Um, about four. And I don't, I don't remember, um, they're not in this picture, um, the birthday picture. Oh, okay. There it is. Uh, one, two, I think there was another one in this group from my basic training. Uh, it's just this girl, I think, Judy, and uh, one other, and, and I don't really remember. Yeah, just... This is a picture of a birthday celebration from good friends in our barracks in Washington, D.C., at Bowling Field. And we had gone out okay, to have a good, good time. And it appears that 
each of the women, or at least a lot of the women, wrote a note in here with their they Saturday did. night. Yeah. Okay. We knew eventually we would be separated. And yeah. Now, have you ever had any kind of reunion or get together with the other women in your unit? No. Okay. No. Okay. My best friend and I, of course, did right. live together, and we had a, a time when we were a lot younger when we'd get together right. often. Okay. But you still keep in touch with Judy. <coughs> I haven't talked to her not too long ago. Okay. Now, you're still at, at Bowling in 1945, I assume. I did, like 45. And do you remember when you first heard that the bomb or the, the bombs had been dropped? No, on, I don't on, remember that at all. Okay. I really don't. As a matter of fact, I went out with the kid that was on that plane, the Enola game. Wow. And he told me what it was. His impression, he fright, you know. Yeah, talk about what he said. Well, I don't, I don't recall that much. Um, he was a kid from New Mexico. Don't remember his name. Um, but he was just kind of horrified that they'd had to do it. Um, Let me ask you a question. This is more of a social question, but you know, women going into the service in large numbers, that, that was relatively new, I think, in World War II. Mm -hmm. What was the reaction of your friends or the people public. you ran into who were not in the service? To, you know, they're used to seeing male soldiers, and now they're seeing a lot of, a lot of female soldiers. What, what kind of reaction did you get? Well, of course, my family and my friends knew who I was, but the general public did not like the women in uniform. Especially the wax. Right. I don't know why. Uh, I just, I wasn't part of any, I, would, I had led a very sheltered life. So I it didn't know how the other half lived, and I didn't know why people looked at the wax and thought they were yeah. something not very nice about them, but huh. knew it wasn't me, so. Did you ever have any incidents where somebody said something to you or treated no, you differently? No, not to me. No. Um, what else can I tell you about my life at Bowling Field or... Well, do you remember when the war ended? I mean, what kind of celebration there was or when... I know there were two different dates, the Europe and Japan, but what was the general mood and reaction and I remember, and I'm trying to think, was I still in the service? I can remember being in a hotel room, looking down. This was in Des Moines, Iowa. No, it wasn't in Des Moines, Iowa. New York, maybe? Um, if I could just pinpoint the date, but I can't. And remember people in the square milling about and bells ringing and horns tooting and um, and I'm tr when was VJ Day? VE Day and VJ Day. Okay. Your letter of commendation says, and I, I, we're going to show this in a minute, but it says you're hereby commended for outstanding services rendered as a stenographer and officer processing clerk in the personnel division of the headquarters commandant office, this headquarters during the period 9 October 45 to date, and the date is the 20th of March 1946. So that... I may, I may have my dates wrong. No, I mean, that may be when you... Th those were the days maybe that you worked in this assignment. And maybe well, that's the only assignment got, I had. Yeah, and then you had basic training before that. So, right. So I'm wrong about... Well, but you, like right you don't remember the exact date, but you remember the celebration of the... Oh, yes. Whatever, everybody... Do you know that must have been... These were all in 1945. But, but, but. Well, when was VJ Day and VE Day? August of 45. Yeah. I don't remember the specific date. So you were in date. Washington then? Yeah. 
I had a year in college in 44, graduated high school 43, year in college in 44, so I must have gone in the service in 45. Okay. Then that was a hotel room in Des Moines, Iowa, where I was just going into basic training oh, okay. that we did VJ, VJ Day. Well, VJ Day was the end of the war because Germany had capitulated earlier. Then it must have been the whatever. Yeah. yeah you, right. Your date of enlistment was July 26, 1945. Yeah, then, okay. then I was okay, a year old. Talk about the days right before you got out of the army. I mean, what did did you have to make a decision whether to stay in or get out, or were you automatically? Oh no, suffered? they just wanted you out. We, they, they had no use for us anymore. Okay. Um, like the rest of the country at that point, women took up the slack when men had to go into the service. They did it in factories, in stores, in all kinds of businesses, and they did it also in the services, the Navy and the Army and the Marines and so forth. Um, when the war ended, they just didn't need our services any longer. Um, no, I, I don't remember having a, a choice. Maybe I could have said, yes, I want to be an Army person, but... I didn't. What did you do when you got out of the service? <clears throat> got a job in Washington, D.C. because I liked, I liked the place. And my best friend, who was with me in service, we got a room in a boarding house run by a lady from my hometown in Iowa. So. I worked at the hospital. I don't remember what Judy did, but she had a job. And we lived in D.C. for, I guess, about a year and a half. And during that time, this young guy I had met in the service, he and I were still going together, and I would go to New York to visit his family with him. Um, and in eventually from Washington, D.C., I moved to New York City, to Brooklyn actually. Um, and then the following year we were married. So. And Judy stayed in Washington, D.C. her home life, right? She, my best friend, married a young guy from Washington or from Maryland, Joe. and she lived there. 3, 30. I'm going to read uh, from your form the unit that you were with, and it, this is the only unit you were with, right? Right. Bowling Field. Right. This is W Squadron, 60th AAFBU, attached to the 2nd AAFBU, Bowling Field, D.C. Would you, I want you to read paragraph 2, we've already read paragraph 1, of this commendation you received from Major General Street, who's the Deputy Commander, this paragraph 2. Four. During the above period, you cheerfully, cheerfully carried the heavy workload placed on you as the sole stenographer in the personnel division. Your diligent efforts in helping process incoming officers were instrumental in alleviating the pressure, the pressure placed on your office by the rapid turnover of personnel. Your initiative cooperation, and willingness to work long and arduously have contributed gre greatly to accomplishing the mission of your office. Well, you're to be congratulated for that. <laughs> Thank you. There's another picture over there of some young, that, that one right there. Could you 
hold that up to the camera and describe what what that group represents? This was a group of ladies who had, and our officers, who were in charge of our group um, at basic training. They were good people, and they were good to us. Yeah, they really were. <laughs> How do you direct a <laughs> bunch of what did yahoos? <laughs> did did the cattery harass you at all, like they do with the men? I mean, yell at your face. Oh yeah, well, I can. Yes, I can remember. And <clears throat> unfortunately, they pick out one person and just write them to. <laughs> and we always felt really bad. Why do they do that? <laughs> Well, they got bored, but <coughs> I'm going to have to quit for a little while. Um, they were, for the most part, pretty fair. Did any of, the, any of them quit? Any of the, your fellow trainees? No. Okay. No. We had um, one little lady who was she was a young gal at the time, but she was, she had problems, and she, I don't know how she made it through, but she did, so. You brought a number of other pictures today. Are, are, is there any particular picture, or are there any particular pictures that you would like to talk about or get on the video? Well, this was a, it, this is, Two good friends that we had on base. The little gal is from New Jersey. She was about a minute big. <laughs> she was a tiny thing. And the guy was just a nice guy from one of my guy friends. And that was at Bowling Field. Uh, we did some nutty things just for something to do, and this was after a snowfall. One of my buddies got down and made snowballs. <laughs> um, you know, you get, it's just the same as life any place else. You have to get out and do things. Uh, this is very tiny, but that's my full, full uniform. And I think it's the only one I have. Speaking of nutty things, is that a bathing suit you got on? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, she does. Okay. She was one of the wacky ones. I mean, just fun wacky. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of adjustment did you have to make after you got out of the service? I mean, what? Very you know, little because I went from um, the barracks at Bowling Field into, a, you know, a a rooming house with my friend um, and had gotten a job right away so you know when you're young you just flow go with the flow you do what's mm -hmm. what you got to do yeah. so I didn't have any problem did you find that you were better equipped to sort of handle life in general that than your friends or people who did not go into the military yes had a different perspective on other people, number one, because I had not met a lot of different kinds of people before. Um, and just what the world would hand you or not hand you, um, you just did it. You did it yourself. Took care of yourself. Um, I don't remember <clears throat> I'm thinking back, <coughs> excuse me, I'm thinking back of some of the people I graduated with from high school and some of the people 
I was in college with, and I kind of think they had a static life. But that's what I felt, and I didn't want that. Um, so that's, that's why I stayed east, I think, when I got out of the Army. I did not want to go back to re retrogress to small farming community, even though my family was there. I just you needed to do excitement. my own thing. Hmm? You like the excitement of New York and, and, no? Yeah, I did, of course, of course, I really did. Spend a couple of minutes and just tell us about so the rest of your life. Well, um, the guy I met in the service, uh, we were married eventually in 1948, um, moved to Long Island. I worked in the city for oh, organizations like the Big Brother Movement, um, I worked in the Pan Am building, I worked in the GM building, I worked for law firms mainly. Um, I became, I don't know, I didn't have a law degree, but I worked in the law departments of law firms and companies uh, all my business life until I retired and loved it. <clears throat> um, what else can you guys remember what I did with my life? I had three be beautiful well, children. That's the most important thing right there. Our, uh, of course. Our son is not, my son is not here, but... Tell him um, about the house that you bought in Levittown. Oh, that was, that was after nice. World War II, there was a group of people, a father and his two sons, their last name was Levitt. And they went on Long Island and built these little bitty houses, row houses. <laughs> but a guy could come in with his family and buy one for $7,000. You went to a meeting to pick out your lot and plunk down your $500, which was a retainer. When you went to get your mortgage for that $7,000, he returned that $500, put it on your mortgage. Really? Or took it off your mortgage. That was our first home, Levittown. And they did that for the World War II vets, right? They Isn't did it that? for anybody who bought a house there. Right. But, but they was... did this mainly for the veterans oh, who needed to be able to afford a house. Yeah. Um, then after that we moved to another town in Long Island, and it's where we raised our family. Kathleen was born in Levittown. Mm -hmm. You were born in Levittown. Um, and that was, that was built, I went to school in an airplane hangar, so it must have been built on uh, some field, correct? Mitchell Field. Mitchell Field. Mitchell Field. No, no, no. Mitchell Field is still there. Um, but it was a military base of some kind of place. Uh, no, it was a big potato or... field, actually. That's what that was. Uh, uh, Long Island is known for it. It was known for its truck farming. And big potato fields and vegetable oh, fields. And right. Levitt just bought up this whole huh. tract and made Levitt town. Uh, well, do you, or, or you, Tony, have any other specific questions or anything that you would like to aspire to talk about? Uh, what was the pin in the box that you said was the duck pin? What was the oh, pin? the ruptured duck. What did that the, mean? You got that when you got out was of the service. One? Is that that one? Yes, and every veteran who got out of the service got one of those pins. <laughs> and that's just what they called it. When you were separated, from the service. Oh, okay. How did you meet Bob in the service? At the USO. Um, where was he from before that? Work on New York. And 
Oh, where was his training? Right. Uh, ah, nice. uh -huh, San Antonio. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that right. was just a thing they did. Um, oh. And where else? Oh, he had been friends with a guy who came in from the Philippines. And that guy and Bob drove all the way across the country from California to New York. Um, and this was... So somewhere he was stationed out in that area. I don't remember. But he had a colorful, colorful uh, service. <laughs> you remember that? that. <laughs> <laughs> no, just don't. I don't know what else to tell you about my service. It was. Would you do it again? Absolutely, mm -hmm. if the circumstances were the same. In today's world, no. Uh, young people are not what they were in, what, 70, 70 years ago, 65 years ago. Well, not, yeah, about yeah. 65 years ago. They're just not the same, just not the same. I wouldn't want, I don't know what the army is like today. It's interesting. Interesting that you bring that up. I wonder what the women are like. In it's a different you know. different world, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And I don't know that I'd want my children to go in the service today. In time of war, that's different. Um, we won't get into a political discussion, but No, no, we won't. <laughs> Best not. Well, we want to thank you so much for, number one, coming in here today and, and sharing your story, but uh, even more importantly, for what you did for the country back in the 40s. I mean, you played a part. What we felt we did. Well, there's no doubt you did. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were a pioneer, too, being a woman going into the service, so you should yes. feel real good about that. Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're... I know Tony and I are honored to have you here, and we appreciate what you did for the country. And well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm sure my color, my story is not as colorful as a lot of them you hear, but that was what we did. Some of the things you told us were more colorful than the <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little too colorful. <laughs> oh, very, very, they were good. Thank okay. you again. Right. Thank you so much. Very nice meeting you both.